and therefore I'll be the presiding officer uh, for today's meeting. And again, just want to welcome you all. Glad you all can come out today. And so we also have the, the meeting is going to be a live stream as well. So we have those here in NECAF, and we also have the live stream information as well. And then we have uh, for you to submit questions. So those of you in the room, you can submit questions as well using the link. And those uh, on the live stream can submit questions, and we're going to be reviewing that. Uh, later. So I'll just hold that up for a second if anybody wants to write that down and use that on your phones. But now if you want to submit questions. I see people taking pictures, so I give you a second. <laughs> will you be tabling live questions from the floor? Yes, I will. Okay, you go ahead. Uh, so here's a uh, and I'll get to your question then. So we have our agenda. So I'm just going to do the uh, opening, and then we're going to have the petition petitioners uh, present for 40 minutes, and then we're going to have the administration present for 40 minutes, and we'll have Q&A. So the Q&A will be from the floor, but it'll also be alternating with those who submit questions on the live stream. And then we're going to have a closed door. So as you see, the time is a little over uh, 90 minutes, at about 110 minutes. We have a, a cutoff time of 10.30, so we can't go past 10.30, but we have a lot of allocated some of for just in case Q&A goes on. Can you go to the next? I just want to start off this, what the REA vision and mission is, just so it's uh, clear what we're about. So the vision is to serve and represent our alumni, alumni community, an institute through enriching alumni and alumni, promoting lifelong connections, and pursuing the mutually beneficial aspirations of our alumni, alumni, and the rest of their community. <coughs> the mission is to connect and grow our alumni and alumni uh, community while investing in the rest of their tomorrow. Our a purpose. As you see, I highlighted item B. And that's really what we're about today uh, in terms of facilitating the exchange of information, ideas, and opinions between Rensselaer and its alumni and alumni. Encourage inclusiveness while fostering mutual respect and understanding among a diverse alumni and alumni body. And this is something that we wanted from the beginning in terms of having our alumni who have concerns and make sure those concerns are voiced and also hearing from the administration as well and one meeting. We've had different occasions where you might get one opinion brought forward and not hear another perspective. And today we have the opportunity to hear both. And that's where I see really what the value is for this meeting. Next. Some of our ground rules. So overall, the discussion is gonna be limited to the topic uh, from the uh, petition. That's, they're gonna be, I'll show you those topics on the next slide. So if there's any questions that are outside of those topics, uh, they will not be entertained at this time. It will be uh, addressed at another uh, time when we go the other meeting. There are also no, no formal votes. As part of the special meeting, the RA board will take any recommendations, and we do have a recommendation that's going to be coming forward, and we'll, we'll address that as RA board outside of this meeting. As I mentioned from the agenda, uh, petitioners have 40 minutes. 
as well as the administration. For Q&A, uh, I'll ask that you limit your question to no more than 30 seconds. And that's for those live in the room. And responses, a maximum for our petitioners or the administration not to give a response more than two minutes. Can we ask who's here from the RAA other than you or the board? Sure. Uh, members of the RAA board, please uh, raise your hand. And then we have uh, multiple members currently watching on the live stream. Great, thank you. How many members are there of the RA board total? We have between 25 and 30 people. And I say that because we, we have our annual meeting that's gonna be announced for next year, I mean, sorry, for next month, where we'll have a formal vote on our proposed slate. And will you let us know where the annual meeting is? Of course, I'm assuming okay. it's public. Yeah, so we, we'll be 30 days in advance notice. Taking minutes is our vice president, Patricia Deloy. Good morning. Good and our timekeeper is Tom Keating, our Vice President. And I, I got confirmation that the live stream is working. Okay, thanks, Tom. And based on that, I do want to make sure everyone silences their cell phones or any other electronic devices so there's no disturbance you do have. Uh, we don't want to disrupt any of the speakers, and also we have the live stream, don't want to have any disruption there as well. And I'll ask that everyone hold your questions into the Q&A portion of the meeting. So if you have a question, and you know, really, a really burning question, write it down. We want the, the uh, petitioners, as well as the administration, to have a lot of material to cover. We want to make sure they have time to cover that material. So we're going to hold the questions uh, till later. Now, if your question doesn't get answered, we can still have that documented, especially if you submit that to the Slido, or if you just give it to us, we can work that address questions later. And on the next slide, we have the uh, actual uh, topics that are summarized. <coughs> so if there's anything outside of this that you have questions on, it won't be addressed at this meeting. And let's just keep that there for a second. Just so everyone can I see people taking pictures again. So, uh, See, for example, uh, this one asked about the three blank passports. That's not an item that was part of the petition, so that wouldn't be an item that you will ask about in this meeting. So that's just an example of items outside of these topics. And I imagine, Bill, John, you're going to show what you submitted for the petition. Um, it's, it's not one of our slides. No. Okay. But, these but are we the, have a copy here. Yeah, and these are the a summarization of the topics that were put forward in the petition. Okay, next. So a expected outcome, as I mentioned, we want to be able to have the different perspectives presented for everyone to review. And then any next steps, for example, recommendations that will be given to the RA board for consideration, that will be items that we'll be discussing as a board. But overall, we want to be able for everyone, all our alumni members, to be able to have the information, understand the current state of the institute, and be able to support, uh, therefore, your uh, your thoughts or opinions uh, after the meeting. And we're going to have those next steps summarized, as well as doing the re recommendation. And also, as I mentioned, we'll have minutes uh, for the meeting that will be available. Okay. Next up, we have our petitioners. And I have 40 minutes, so uh, Tom, you're going to start. <coughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Bill Chris, and uh, I had the pleasure of being uh, president of the student union from 67 to year 68. I graduated uh, with my master's degree year later, and with my wife Judy, also State graduated in 69, uh, spent the next 50 years working to support 
support the Your Insulator Alumni Association and RPI in any way we can at whatever post the U.S. Air Force chose to, uh, to send me. Uh, two and a half years ago, I found myself being a founding member of Renew Rensselaer. That's why we are here today. Uh, John Crobb, who is uh, right in the front row here, you're going to be hearing from him in just a few minutes, uh, has spent many decades trying to strengthen and improve the fraternity and sorority system here at RPI. And he'll walk you through a number of the uh, points that we have raised in the petition, uh, which uh, is substantially longer than uh, the summary that Kareem mentioned, and it's uh, on our website if you'd like to take a look at that. That would be, that'd be great. Um, to start, I guess I'd, I'd like to address the, the new, particularly the new RAA board members. There aren't too many of you here. So I guess I need to address the, the camera uh, remotely. Uh, we had hoped that we had had this meeting a week ago when there were plenty of alumni and plenty of RAA board members uh, present, but uh, that didn't work out for the administration. So now we have plenty of administration members here, but not too many RAA board members. So is the microphone picking up in the room or is it only for the live stream? Um, the Hello. Only for live stream. Okay, quiet. thank you. Yeah, Sound speak a little louder? Uh, just Close a tad, to the please. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> I'm unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Okay. Um, <laughs> specifically to the new, newly appointed uh, RAA board members, uh, you very nicely volunteered your time, uh, uh, which is precious to all of us, to help uh, RPI promulgate its, its newest proposals and policies. But there's another responsibility that wasn't so important in years gone past, but is now. And that purpose of the RAA board is that the little, little less than a quarter down of the first page of the yearly statement that goes to the IRS. And it says the mission of the RAA is to support and represent RPI alumni. And it is that reason that we have called for this meeting for you to do so, because the rank and file of RPI are not feeling heard, and they are angry and concerned. And those concerns led to the petition to call this special meeting. And we have a lot of data and facts that we don't have time to go over today, but are on the Rensselaer, RenewRensselaer.org website. I encourage you to take a look at it a lot of research that we've done over the last two years, uncovering a myriad of vectors, all of which are not pointing in a good direction. We're concerned our alma mater is heading in the wrong direction, and we wish to use the RAA board as our voice, which is your charter, to get that message to the Board of Trustees, to improve governance of the institution, and get this ship of state pointed once again toward the greatness that has had, it has had in the past. Our objectives and that of the RA board, as Kareem has so nicely uh, summarized for us here, are, are in, in constants. We're all after the same thing. You may not agree with our tactics, but our objective is the same. After you hear what John has to say, and you read the, uh, the data that we have uncovered on the uh, Renew Rensselaer website, if you don't think we're in trouble, then you're standing too close to the Kool-Aid machine. We need to have open discussions on these things. We need to get new courses of action. And I thank Kareem for setting this meeting up. So John, you want to take it away? Yes, thank you, Bill. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Um, I have the unenviable task of running through uh, about 20 slides. Uh, which I've been cramming for for the past 24 hours. Um, the first statement I'd like to make is that we are here to build up and not to tear down, to identify problems and offer solutions. I think by the time you've heard from, from me and, and, and us in, in this slide presentation, I, that you will agree with that statement. Okay, here's a brief timeline of what led to this meeting. Uh, we, Bill said we formed about two years ago. We did extensive fact-finding and research. We actually had a meeting uh, 
uh, with trustees, uh, one in particular noteworthy one was in New York City in the spring of 2017 with the chair, the vice chair, and another member of the board. Uh, we came away less than satisfied that we were being heard. So in January of this year, we made the very difficult decision of launching our website. And I want to emphasize that was a difficult decision. Uh, but in the end, we felt we were putting the long-term interests of the Institute ahead of any potential sh short-term effects or fallout, uh, especially because four of us were putting our names on the website. And that we wanted to do that for a reason and to show that we stood behind what we were doing. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that uh, that is a fact-based website. We tried to adhere to very strict policy of having supportable data and nothing that could be questioned. We, we sent an email to the chairman of the board asking us to alert to us to any errors or misstatements that he thought were incorrect. And, and we pledged that we would correct them. So far, we haven't heard back. Then we, then we uh, in the early part of this year, we requested two meetings to meet with the RAA board to present ourselves and to uh, our agenda, our platform, and our motives. We, we thought it was important that they get to know us personally. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So we petitioned for this meeting, uh, but also last weekend, taking advantage of the fact that so many alumni were on campus, we held an informational meeting. So, some of you were there on the last Saturday. So that's, that's where we are. That's how we got here. Next slide. We did a lot of work, we did a lot of work on financials. And here are the, the key findings. We found the school has a heavy debt load. It's experienced rating downgrades. It's carrying a substantial interest burden. It has relatively low liquidity, forcing it to rely on banks for working capital. The endowment has been static in terms of growth over a long stretch of time, well below peers. We have a slide on that. The research revenues have not lived up to expectation and now have fallen below the level of expenditures. There's substantially reduced alumni participation rate in terms of giving to the institute. And in, in, a, in a little less than two years, we're facing a refinancing need for 205 million of bonds that are coming due. I want to emphasize, I don't think that's in, in jeopardy. I, in fact, I have confidence it will get done. It's a, it's a question of what it's going to cost us. And then lastly, we found that uh, due to the tight financial situation, maintenance of infrastructure has been lagging. So, so let's talk a little bit about the credit ratings. Uh, Standard Poor's and Moody's are the two uh, prominent rating agencies for credit ratings. We've had three downgrades since 2000 from S&P and two from Moody's. Uh, that's put us in a, in a position where we're below the quality levels of comparable schools like Carnegie Mellon and Case, Lehigh, MIT, and even RIT and uh, also WPI. So we think that's not reflective of the full potential of our institute. We think there are ways that we can begin to address this. Again, we don't think it's a crisis, but we think it's important that we're aware of this, that, we're, that all of the alumni are aware of this. Okay. So what, what has happened with research? Well, this, these, these are the hard numbers over, uh, over the last 10 years. Um, in the early 2000s, there was an adoption of the Rensselaer Plan. We had a targeted goal of 250 million of sponsored research, and we haven't quite gotten there. Um, we, were, we were on a good track through the early 2000s. Even through the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, it continued to climb because there was substantial government funding coming through the Obama Stimulus Plan to fund uh, university research. But that money re began to run out around 2013, and has, uh, and it, it appears to us that RPI has been hurt significantly by that. If you if you just look at the the, the numbers, it, it peaked around 98 million of revenue. Uh, as of 2017, it was about 75, and this is a good time to mention that we will be getting new financial data soon. 
RPI usually posts its financial statements at the end of October or early November. Those go onto a public website, so we will be reviewing them and updating this data as it's available. Um, expenditures, the red line continued to stay up. We're not quite exactly sure why that is. Um, we think there's some unabsorbed overhead in those numbers, uh, so it's a, it's a question of volume, costs not being absorbed due to the lower level of, of revenue. But uh, when, we, when we asked, when we made an inquiry to the VP of research about whether he could give us a breakdown, we didn't hear back from him. So we, we, we can't give you a breakdown of the, of the expenditure numbers. Okay. Alumni participation rate. This is, this is perhaps the most troubling for, for me. Um, I have the privilege of being married to a Dartmouth alum, and uh, Dartmouth alumni have a participation rate of something in the 43 to 44% range. And I saw this slide and I'm like, why is this? Why, why, why are we walking away? Well, there are two issues here. Um, one is just the effects of wealth concentrate, growing wealth concentration in the country. So if you're measuring participation on a per capita basis, you have fewer people giving more money or bigger, bigger donations and, uh, and more people giving nothing. Uh, but when we, we did a rough comparison to um, some peer schools and we found that while there was a general decline in participation rate among universities, ours, ours was greater than the average. Uh, for, for the peers, and so we found that disturbing. Um, okay. So after looking at participation rate, we looked at the absolute dollars given, and this is a chart going back to the early 90s, because we were able to source data from bond offering statements uh, for the dollars uh, annually reported for gifts and bequests. And, it, and that's the blue line, it's a lumpy, or it's a choppy line because gifts tend to be lumpy, so we smoothed it out with a three-year trailing average. And you see, from about 2000 going forward, there was a really strong increase. There was a lot of excitement about the Rensselaer plan and the initiatives being undertaken. And then it, you know, it plateaued for a little while, but then the financial crisis hit, and uh, of course everyone's wealth was impacted and it took a substantial drop, uh, but it hasn't recovered. We haven't gotten back to where we were even, you know, six, ten, you know, eight, ten years ago. So we started asking, well, why, why is this? Uh, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, so we explored. So let's go forward. An example uh, of what that has resulted in, or a, go, a good illustration of, of, of what those low levels of participation and giving have resulted in is that we are endowment poor as an institute. We're trying to play in the big league game with a minor league endowment. It's very tough to do. You can see MIT by a factor of 11 or 12 uh, exceeds our endowment level and the growth rate over a, over a 10 year period that we were able to measure was a, over 100% and ours was eight and a half. Other schools that are noteworthy, obviously Georgia Tech and Carnegie Mellon, two that we considered real comps for, for RPI. Um, and we're just, we're not getting it done in terms of the fundraising. And this has put the, put the school in a bind, okay. So those are the financial highlights. We'll, we'll move on to some of our academic findings. Um, there's been a much heralded uh, reporting of a, a, a boom in applications at RPI. We think that's great. It's allowed us to ramp up enrollment at the undergraduate level, which has helped the financial situation over the last three, four years. But it actually isn't that extraordinary. It was about in line with peer averages. And the reason for that is there's post-financial crisis, there was a huge demand for STEM degrees because people came to the realization they better study what they can get employment in. You know, the job market really changed post-financial crisis. 
And, and so there's been a rush. I mean, the technology industry, we don't have to tell you about what the NASDAQ average has been doing in the, in the, you know, in the last 10 years. So there's strong demand and we're benefiting from it and that's great. We're glad for that. But in that period, the yield on fr freshman applicants has dropped from about 32% to a little under 20%. And for those of you who don't know what yield means, that's the ratio of students who actually enroll over the total number that were accepted. To us, that's an indication of how representative it is of uh, RPI being their first choice school or, or a most desirable school. It's actually the key statistic that most admissions officers look at in terms of how they're doing. Um, we looked at the faculty numbers, the tenured and tenure track numbers were well below the 500 target. Obviously that's being worked on. Uh, the student faculty, student to faculty ratio is below our peers. We think, you know, that's un it's really unfortunate, but we also think it's a function of financial resources. Uh, we'll have a chart on that. Our U.S. News and World Report rankings have been essentially unchanged after going up. They're, they've now come back down. Uh, our graduate enrollment level is well below plan and the prior years. And uh, one thing that I found particularly troubling was the cancellation of the distance learning program in the early 2000s. That was a program that was nationally recognized and award-winning and really ahead of its time. And right as the internet and the massive open online courses were gaining stride, we were out of the game. Uh, I've actually heard some reports that we may be trying to get back in that, and we hope that's the case. But that was important or significant because it severed some key corporate relationships. The companies used to rely on RPI to give advanced training to their employees, and we lost that. And it also severed some relationships with our alumni who were benefiting from RPI learning while it's still on the job. In fact, one of the recipients of the award uh, honorary degree at uh, commencement this May thanked RPI for allowing her to get her master's degree while she was still working. That's no longer possible. Okay. Talked about the academic rankings, U.S. News Report. We started out around 49th. We had some very good years. Then we, hit, we started hitting trouble on the financial side. We bounced back, and uh, now we're now we're back down to about where we started. This we, you know, we were we were hopeful that by this time we would have moved up in the rankings, and, and we haven't we haven't been able to do it. Thanks. Uh, I mentioned tenure and tenure track faculty. Uh, this is you know these are the professors who uh, probably do most of the teaching and and uh, bring most of the research to the Institute, um, we've been struggling there. You know, the goal is to get to 500. We showed some promise initially, but we haven't gotten there. And I have a, I have a, a very close friend who was a professor here for 20 years, and he's told me it's very expensive to recruit top quality talent. So uh, we're disadvantaged by our ability to pay. Next. <coughs> Student-faculty ratio. Uh, need to note that this is, a, this is an inverted chart, so the higher the ratio, the lower uh, you are on the graph. Uh, that's, we put it that way because that's considered a worse, a worse position to be in, having a high student-faculty ratio. You can see our peer group, for the most part, has been well above us for a long time. Okay. All right. Graduate enrollment. This was a big part of the Rensselaer plan, especially with respect to PhDs. This is, uh, to quote the plan, Rensselaer will grow its research enterprise dramatically and greatly expand doctoral programs. We haven't gotten there. The goal was 1,600. For the last available data was from 2015 when it was broken out. Uh, we started at 805, and as of 2015, we're at 831, and we don't think that's gotten much better but we don't, ha we don't have access to the data. Uh, on total graduate resident, uh, students, the goal was 2,500. The reality is uh, it was 1,500 in 2000 to start, and then it's fallen. Now, in this is the effects of the distance learning program being, hit, being canceled. But um, 
Uh, excuse me, no, that they would be non-resident. I'm sorry. So this is representative of resident uh, master's degree and PhD uh, enrollment, and it's just we haven't been getting there, and and this is hurting the reputation of the school. Um, students pursuing master's degree in 2000, about 1,100, fell to 278. This is the one that was impacted by the distance learning program being canceled. So we've lost those connections to those alumni who were you know, getting RPI education as they worked. Okay. So the third area we looked at was governance. A big source of discontent has been what's been going on with the student union. Um, I can't emphasize enough how many uh, alumni have been upset about that. Uh, there were over 5,500 petition signatures gathered on, uh, in 2016 in about two weeks, well, no, maybe two months. Uh, and and we've, you know, we hear the line that um, there's been no real change, but yet there has been real change three important points to make there. Student sense no longer approves changes to the student handbook. Executive board control over activity fee and budget is significantly reduced. And student, students no longer have representation on trustee committees. In other words, the information flow from students to the trustees has been cut off. Uh, there have been a lot of articles and press about free speech at RPI, uh, FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education has ranked RPI among the worst for First Amendment rights. The New York Civil Liberties Union has also put out pronouncements. Um, we think there's a culture of fear on this campus for the students and for the faculty and staff. And I know that to be a fact because a very prominent alum from the business school, Peter Vanderman, uh, who's recently retired, was executive in residence. Um, on some advisory committees for both the um, Lally School and the School of Engineering, he came forward unsolicited to us about three weeks ago and said, I want to speak out. I want to do more than just sign your, sign your platform. He thinks there is no initiation, initiative coming from the lower ranks moving up the chain of command. It's all about a top-down management model. There, the, the shared governance that is commonplace in universities has disappeared and we're, we are functioning under a top-down management model. And I wrote a, an op-ed to the poly last year. I said, top-down governance is great if it's working, but our data shows it's not. So something's got to change. Um, we found there's a, a lack of unfiltered dialogue between the trustees and students. We talked about that, but also mm -hmm. among the faculty and the alumni. We hear reports that any time anyone is asked to make a presentation to the board, it has to be pre-screened, and there has to be a post-mortem on what happened at the meeting. People are ushered in and out of the meetings in a hurried fashion. There is really no flow of communication up and down the chain, and that's disturbing. And from a financial standpoint, my, my favorite topic, based on my experience, is we found a minimal amount of financial transparency. Try to find RPI's financial statements. I was lucky in that I was a professional. I knew where they were likely to be because I worked in the bond market. RPI borrows a lot of money in the public bond markets. They have to present their annual report and financial statements to the bond investors. I was lucky enough to figure out where they were. Uh, but when I tried to call the finance department and ask them to provide them to me, I was told we don't make them available. That raised some red flags for me as a financial professional. So next. So what if we do nothing? We see substantial financial risk leaving RPI vulnerable to a downturn in the economy. We, we see academic standing at risk because we can't make the investments that we need to make. We see a, a board of trustees and a president viewed as insular and non-caring when it, when it comes to outside opinions and alumni oh. voice, exp, uh, expression of alumni opinions and student opinions. Um, the, the, maybe the most troubling thing is that the alumni, the people who went here and will always be alumni, are who, what is essential for financial recovery, and they're not happy. They've been disaffected. You saw the charts on the data. 
the Rensselaer plan has not met his objectives. We're, we're not in the top tier currently. Uh, alumni, if we don't make changes, if we don't have some important reforms to appeal to our alumni base, our alumni giving will continue to struggle. And lastly, and most worrisome, is that we will lose competitiveness, competitiveness relative to our peer group. So what are we asking for before the, we're going to make an appeal to the RAA board? We want them to carefully consider the long-term implications of, of doing nothing. What we'd really want them to do is endorse our platform and urge the RPI board of trustees to implement it. And I'll present the planks of the platform in a moment. You'll see why we think it's valuable. <coughs> And we'd ask the RA board to also uh, take the step to communicate support for these changes to all RPI alumni. Let, let them hear from you. Let them hear about us. Let's increase the communication flow. Okay. So what do we stand for? What are we advocating? Well, the first point is about improving campus climate and governance practices as well as financial transparency. We found that RPI is actually a dues-paying member of a group called the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, the AGB. We would like their policies to be followed and adhered to. We don't think that's happening right now. We'd like to encourage more communication up and down the management chain, unfiltered dialogue with the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. <coughs> My favorite, number three, we think that the alumni should have some representation and the ability to elect one or two, but most likely two would be the optimal members of the board, uh, of RPI's board of trustees. Again, I'll come back to Dartmouth and my wife's situation. The Dartmouth alumni elect a third of their board. My wife gets ballots in the mail and she can go online mm -hmm. and vote for candidates for the board of trustees. We have nothing. Now, I'm not blaming anyone for that except Stephen Van Rensselaer. <laughs> that's, that's the way he set it up. But I, we're in the modern era now, and I think people demand more voice and more participation. And I think that would be a great move, a great initiative to take to try to bring alumni back in the fold. I actually tried to push this issue as far back as 2011 through the then president of the RAA. He took it to the, to the top of the house. And, met stiff resistance on this idea. I think it's worthy of strong consideration from the RAA board. Uh, we think the RAA should have some space in its own magazine. The Rensselaer Magazine is the official publication of the Rensselaer Alumni Association. And there's no column there for the president of the RAA to speak, to give us an editorial or express themselves, or the board for, to express themselves. We think that should change. We'd like to affirm the independence of the union. This is a real emotional hot button. It's a real source of pride for this institute that we have for so long maintained an independent student-run union as large as it is. We see no reason for that to have changed. And it is changing. It's already changed. And people are angry about it. Next. The next two are easy. Focus on debt reduction. With greater alumni involvement, that can be made possible. We can also help grow the endowment, but we think those are goals that we should target and tell the alumni that we're targeting. Number eight, renew our traditional focus on undergraduate academic programs. Um, we actually think that's happening somewhat by default. I mean, we're ha since 2015, 2014, we've seen a steep rise in undergraduate enrollment. We've gone from about 5,500 undergraduates to 6,500 but we haven't seen the growth in the graduate programs. So let's focus on our core business. You know, we're, we're facing a very competitive market in a, in a cost-conscious environment, and we'd like to move that forward. We, de we should develop and continue to promote ourselves as why not change the world, as our slogan. We think that's a great slogan. We think we should continue that. And, we, and at the appropriate time, when the current uh, president's term, contract term, um, 
expires, we think there should be a, a broad search involving all constituents, including alumni, students, and faculty in the selection of the, of the next leader. Okay, so how are we going to recommend this? We have a resolution. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would like to recommend that this body approve the following resolution. Whereas we, the members of the Rensselaer Alumni Association, endeavor to further the educational mission of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and whereas we seek to strengthen RPI by stimulating greater alumni engagement, participation, and financial support, Therefore, be it resolved that it is the sense of this meeting to recommend to the RAA Board of Trustees that it should vote to endorse the Renew Rensselaer platform as it appears on its website, renewrensselaer.org, and then to follow up by urging the RPI Board of Trustees to adopt and implement all of the policies, principles, and goals of the Renew Rensselaer plan, plat or the Renew Rensselaer platform, thereby triggering the commitments of support from the alumni who signed our platform which is now over a thousand. So I submit that to you, Mr. Chairman. I'll say again, I second the motion. Uh, can we get on uh, Nathan Clash here from the second? John, Can I repeat that for the audience? Yes, and apologies. Uh, earlier, there was some uh, audio issues, so hopefully you all can hear uh, better now. Uh, so if anyone sees me on my phone, I'm just reviewing the comments on Slido. And so I saw that, John, they can hear you better. And hopefully you can all hear me. And before I go forward, we already had discussion. So this is, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, opening statements, there's no uh, formal votes. This is something that's coming to the RAA board for consideration. So it has been moved and seconded by John, uh, Peter's name by John Druk, resolution for a special meeting of RAA, October 8th, 2018, whereas we, the members of the Rensselaer Alumni Association, endeavor to further the educational mission of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and whereas we seek to strengthen RPI by stimulating greater alumni engagement, participation, and financial support. Therefore, be it resolved, that is the sense of this meeting to recommend to the RAA Board of Trustees that it should, one, vote to endorse the Renew Rensselaer platform as it appears on this website, renew, renewrensselaer.org, and two, urge the RPI Board of Trustees to adopt and implement all the policies, principles, and goals of the Renew Rensselaer platform, thereby triggering the commitments of support from alumni signers to the platform. As I mentioned, this is more of a informal review and John, I understand we just want to take a raise of hands who those who are supportive of this. All right, all opposed? Okay. Can you Sir, may we have an account for the number of people who are in support of this? Yeah, you should, because people can't see all this, say like you counted properly 25 versus whatever the numbers so are. Wouldn't that make that an official vote? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. there's no formal vote. This was just a, a sense of the room. So those uh, watching the live stream, they can see the raise of hands. How many were opposed? It was one hand. Order, 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 Mr. Chairman. Uh, since we are following Robert's rules, and the motion was seconded and put to the floor for a vote, uh, I think it's the appropriate comment to make is that the motion carried. Yes, the motion carries. Overwhelmingly. <laughs> yeah. It means that the REA board was going to, is going to review this recommendation. It's, it's just letting the RAA board know this is the recommendation from the petitioners to review. There's no nothing binding to this. It's, order. Yeah. Order. it's not only from the petitioners, but it's from the body of this meeting. Yes. Including everyone in attendance who is the member. Yep. Thanks, John. Okay. And also want to note for those submitting questions on Slido, Please also use your, uh, your name and class year for submitting questions. And then when we do get to Q&A portion, those who stand up with questions, please state your name and class year. And then, are we? We're done. All right, thank you. <laughs>
Okay. Bill noted that it was on time. And, and again, I'll just mention that we'll uh, repeat any questions if we do get any, but as I mentioned, we're not gonna have questions during the presentations. But I uh, made sure that I would do that uh, going forward. Next up, we'll have the uh, administration. Do you have, we're just gonna come up one by one. And make sure you hold the, the, from uh, the comments I was reading, make sure you hold the mic closer to your mouth. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Kolb, not to be f confused with John Crobb. I'm a class of 79, not to be confused with the class of 78. Um, thank you. Uh, and actually, that's true. We met uh, for the first time a couple weeks ago. Um, thank you, uh, Kareem, uh, and the Rensselaer Alumni Association Board uh, for inviting us to speak uh, this morning. Clearly, there are some issues in front of us, uh, and we'd like to respond to those. Let me first suggest that the world around Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute is much different. Could you introduce yourself in front of the people? What do you do in the administration? Yeah, I would be glad to. Uh, I'm John Kolb. Class of 79, I'm the Vice President of Information Technology and Services and Chief Information Officer here at Rensselaer. Thank you. Uh, any, I'm sorry, anything else? You're a staff member. I'm in the administration. Anything else? Let me first suggest that the world around Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute is much different than what it was when my parents were here in the 1940s or when my sister or, or I were here in the 1960s and 70s, or even when my children were here over the last two decades. It is a more competitive, as we have heard, and government regulated environment, which has led to the importance and urgency of positioning Rensselaer for the challenges that lay ahead. I would encourage you to take away from this meeting that we are well positioned. The business fundamentals really are solid, as you will hear. We have great faculty, we have motivated students, we have dedicated staff, and we actually have some amazing alumni and alumnae. However, we still have challenges, particularly in the endowment resources as compared to others. The chair of a recent Middle States Review made the comment that, quote, Rensselaer continues to fight above its weight, unquote. As alums, the one aspect that we can change to dramatically help our alma mater is to increase our engagement and, give, and giving. I am joined today by <clears throat> several of my colleagues who are here to provide information and perspective on the fiscal environment, the physical infrastructure, academic standing, and market position for Rensselaer. Specifically, we will hear from Barbara Howe, <coughs> excuse me, our Vice President of Finance uh, and Chief Financial Officer on Endowment and Debt. We'll hear from Greg Easton, our Vice President of Advancement on donations to the institution. We'll hear from Claude Rounds, our VP of Administration on Capital Investments and Construction. We'll hear from John Dordick, the Howard P. Eiserman Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering and former Vice President for Research. And John Wexler, our VP of Enrollment Management on Academic Standing. We'll hear from Curtis Powell, our Vice President of Human Resources on Institute Government and Performance Planning. We'll hear from Lenormand Strong, our VP of Student Life, and Travis Apcar, our AVP of Student Life and St Dean of Students on Student Governance in the Rensselaer Union. And then we'll hear from Richie Hunter, our VP of Strategic Communications and External Relations on ongoing communications. We will be comprehensive but succinct in providing information to you regarding, one, strong financial and business footing, two, strategic investments in people, programs, platforms, and partnerships, Three, strong academic research and scholarly environment. And four, current governance and planning. I think you'll find that while there are significant challenges for Rensselaer, this institution is well positioned to flourish as we go forward into the next 200 years of our history. Thank you. Barbara. Good 
morning. My name is Barbara Howe, and I'm the new Vice President for Finance and CFO here at Rensselaer. I can't tell you how happy I am here to be here. Um, I come, uh, I join in early September, and I come from a long career in both higher education and industry, most recently as the <coughs> VP and Controller and Treasurer at Columbia University. <coughs> As you know, over the past 20 years, the university has invested in its future. It remains committed to that plan. We continue to strengthen our financial position in, in fiscal 18. We have significantly increased our net assets, approximately 18% over fiscal 17. And this is driven by a combination of growth in the endowment, reduction in long-term debt, and in the defined benefit plan liabilities. Late in 2016, we committed to managing our debt and endowment levels so that within three years, the endowment would exceed our long-term debt. We refer to this as the crossover plan. <clears throat> At the time, debt exceeded the endowment by more than 100 million. I'm happy to um, provide to you information that we've substantially achieved this accomplishment as of June 2018, and as of today, we have fully achieved that. So the endowment now exceeds the long-term debt balances. The university continues to focus on increasing its endowment, both from gifts and investment returns. Um, alumni engagement is a critical part of that. We <coughs> continue to manage and look to reduce the debt levels. Um, we, on, on an ongoing basis, assess the opportunities to reduce this future debt service. We, in 2018, have a significantly improved positive operating result on a gap basis and uh, had very strong cash management during the year. We have consistent cash flows from operations from 17 to 18 and 18 we funded the 16 million dollars of uh, contribution to the pension plan from operations. <coughs> we our financials continue on our financial metrics can continue on an improving trajectory we anticipate this to continue. It's supported by the largest and the strongest freshman class that we've had here at Rensselaer. Um, rating agencies recognize this and uh, point to our core strengths and financial improvements as in strong indicators for our financials going forward. Increasing the endowment and managing the debt will help move the, the rating agency ratings forward as well. Separately on the pension, the university is committed to meeting the commitments it's made to members of the defined benefit plan and it continues to manage these liabilities aggressively. Um, at, as a recap, in 2014, the plan was frozen to new accruals in, in, seven, in fiscal 17 and 18 Op, lump sum options were increased to further help assist with managing the liability level. In fiscal 19, we expect that we will contribute approximately 13 million to that plan. Um, Curtis Powell will pr provide some additional information. Um, and separately, we have, as a financial institution, um, as a private institution, excuse me, Rensselaer provides strategic information to its community. <clears throat> as mentioned before, financial information is submitted annually as required by our debt agreements and is publicly available following the submission. We're in compliance with all of our disclosures and um, as required under these, these agreements. I'll just repeat the uh, questions. We will not be taking any questions during the presentations, but uh, there, there is no uh, charts that are being presented. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> Curtis will provide some information on the pension. Great, and I'm glad you have a great memory. I'm <clears throat> Curtis Powell. I'm the Vice President for Human Resources. Just let me give you um, information regarding this legacy pension plan that we've had to fund. Now, uh, this plan 
it's very complex in nature with the benefits and the various features that this plan offers to our participants. The plan in 1993 was frozen to any new participants. And as Barbara indicated to you in 2014, I put a hard freeze on that plan and we stopped the benefits. However, to preserve the benefits that uh, our faculty and staff has earned, the president went to the board and made a strong recommendation that she wanted to continue to fund the plan. Now, let's talk about the funding of that because that impacts the financials, as you know. Now, you know, prior to 1999, $15 million was contributed to the plan. $15 million. Since that time, 1999 to present, we have contributed $230 million to that plan. $230 million. So when you talk about our finances, you can understand the impact that any university would have in having to contribute that amount. And so, we will stay committed to funding that plan and work out provisions to work through the plan so that the individuals, participants in that plan, that their benefits are preserved. And so you can understand that working through that, we need your support in doing that. So let me turn it over to my colleague. I think that's Greg Easton. Thank you, Curtis. So good morning, I'm Greg Easton, Vice President for Institute Advancement. I arrived here in 2014. This morning, I arrived here in 2014, thank you. <laughs> so I prepared a brief statement to read to you today and, and just to, uh, in my short tenure here, where we're at and what I see. And I believe this is a great time to be at Rensselaer. And Rensselaer, I believe, is on the move. And philanthropy is on the increase as we prepare for the third century. And I'd first like to thank our trustees, our donor community, and our volunteers for supporting the transformation of your university. You continue to make the difference in the lives of our students, faculty, and the Rensselaer community. In 2008, Rensselaer competed a $1.4 billion campaign, which took Rensselaer forward. And in 2017, Rensselaer launched a multi-year fundraising campaign with more than $400 million. And what are these gifts supporting? Scholarship and financial aid, endowment for faculty chairs, and gifts to build out the campus for the third century. So I wanna, first, I wanna wish and express gratitude to all of you here and that are watching for your support for this transformative campaign. Rensselaer has transformed and continues to transform to meet the global challenges now and in the future. You should know more than 100 million of the gifts committed so far has been added to Rensselaer's endowment, strengthening the university on all fronts. And the successful conclusion of the campaign will enhance Rensselaer's standing in the world as a world-class technological research university with global reach and impact. I do wanna say, yes, annual giving is not where we want it to be, nor where it should be. Alumni hold in your hands the opportunity to support your alma mater. To increase the number of those who support the campaign, Institute Advancement is partnering with the Rensselaer Alumni Association. Together, we've identified strategies to increase giving across the board, and especially to increase alumni giving rate. I'm grateful to the RA board for partnering with us on this important endeavor. I'd like to conclude by really inviting you all to join us, because what we're doing in this campaign supports the students supports our faculty, some that are here, and supports the, this institution going forward. And I know there'll be some questions later on, but I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk. Thank you. And Cloud Rounds? Uh, good morning. I'm Claude Rounds, the Vice President for Administration. And I'm going to just uh, discuss some highlights of the Institute's uh, uh, capital planning process. Um, it's a strategic planning process which follows the model of the Rensselaer Plan 
and it's an integrated part of the annual performance planning uh, process that we go through every year, and it's closely aligned with the highest priorities of the Institute. The investments, which are over $800 million under the Rensselaer Plan, have enabled and supported the physical, the transformation of the physical facilities and the cyber infrastructure across the campus. You cap, we have made, uh, we constructed new buildings and platforms. Uh, we made capital improvements for equipment and technology, renovated and repurposed facilities, and we provided facilities and technology to support our research, teaching, and the student experience. It's been broad-based and just generally distributed throughout the campus and has touched almost every aspect of the campus in one way or another. And I'm just gonna give you a few examples of over 2,300 projects um, that we have done under the uh, capital plan. Uh, new buildings and platforms, you know what they are, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time focused on those. Um, new campus infrastructure. Um, there was a dis discussion about the maintenance of our aging infrastructure. We've in installed $30 million worth of new campus infrastructure, including an underground uh, electrical substation, a boiler plant, a chiller plant, new sanitary water and storm water system, and we even rebuilt College Avenue at our expense. And some of you folks were here when College Avenue wasn't a very good road to drive on, okay? Um, we provided uh, investments in the visualization lab at the Darren Freshwater Institute, a new material, uh, material characterization core, um, research cores in CBIS, and we've upgraded them as, as, as time has gone on. Um, we developed the Center for Flow Physics and Water Elite, and we've upgraded and improved research labs to facilitate the hiring of our world-class faculty. We've also focused on innovative uh, and improved pedagogy. Uh, we continue on an ongoing basis, upgrade classrooms, lecture halls, studios, and teaching labs. We repurpose space in, in Haas for the quarter of creativity. Uh, we've constructed an auto video studio, uh, studio and music practice rooms for the Haas music and media engineering program. In partnership with an alum and uh, Douglas Mercer, uh, we've developed the laboratory uh, for student exploration and innovation in the School of Engineering. In the VAST studio, which is the visualization, amortization, um, simulation technology studio, which is the core of our game study program. And we've constructed an experimental station at LINAC uh, for, to expand research and academic capabilities at LINAC. And that's just a few that we, in the area of research. We've enhanced the student experience. We've renovated and put an addition on Academy Hall uh, to create a student services center. We've expanded the health center and the counseling center to support the needs of our students. We've repurposed space for the off-campus commons. We've renovated 16 resident halls and we have an annual role and renovation uh, program. Uh, we've expanded campus housing capacity. We've renovated and expanded uh, dining facilities. And recently, we upgraded the men's baseball facility. Okay. It's important that we, this capital plan also focus on the safety and security of the Rensselaer community. We've installed sprinkler systems throughout our resident halls and any um, um, Greek chapter house owned by Rensselaer. We've installed fire alarm systems, <coughs> security technology, uh, emergency, additional emergency generation capacity and UPS capacity. Uh, we've installed new hazard ventilation systems and we've improved campus lighting. Um, in the area of information technology and cyber infrastructure, uh, we've done extensive network and in fiber infrastructure upgrades. Uh, we've developed the Center for Computational Initiatives, uh, which has provided us with the high performance computing capability that we need. We developed a data warehouse and we've a an significant focus on adding and increasing the IT storage and the computational infrastructure. We also maintain the campus buildings and our infrastructure. And in addition to the new infrastructure we installed with the 30 million, we've invested another 70 million in our campus infrastructure for a total of over $100 million invested in campus infrastructure 
under the Rensselaer plan. We replaced roofs on 40 buildings. We did a substantial slope stabilization project in front of the Carnegie building to keep it from sliding down the hill. Um, we've done extensive exterior repairs and restoration on West Hall, JSRC, JEC, um, and, and the Lowe Center. Um, we've in continuously replaced electrical feeders and substations. We've upgraded and repaired our steam and condensate distribution systems. Uh, we've replaced air conditioning and chillers and cooling towers and boilers and heating systems. Um, and one thing I like to point out because it's, thing, it's one of the things people mention the most is the new streetscape and landscaping that we've done throughout campus. Okay. Let me talk a minute just about impact, okay? It's the 10th anniversary of impact this year. And if you happen to uh, be in town yesterday and saw the Times Union, uh, there's a tremendous write up uh, from the Times Union um, regarding the 10th anniversary at impact. Impact has become exactly what we envisioned. It's a cut -it edge facility for artistic performance but it also has provided us with the facilities and infrastructure to do in impactful research. The Cognitive immer and Immersive Lab in our partnership with IBM is a good example of that. But IMPACT was a challenging and difficult site. Uh, the site that was chosen for IMPACT certainly created those kind of conditions. However, Rensselaer recognized and considered those conditions even before the architectural competition uh, for the building. There was slope and geological conditions and it required a carefully planned database approach to the design of the foundations. We did extensive engineering and geological and geotechnical uh, evaluations. Um, and then we did a lot of test borings, groundwater monitoring, cone penetration testing, and a number of other uh, uh, tests that can be done to identify uh, what you have to deal with uh, from a um, site perspective. And as a result of all that testing and all that analysis, um, it gave us what we needed to do uh, carefully evaluate and determine a plan for managing the site conditions, groundwater, and slope stability. And coupled with other expert reviews and analysis, including those performed by um, Rensselaer faculty, including the renowned faculty of Roberto Dobe in civil engineering, and we, we engage uh, Henry Hank Snabel, one of the most uh, renowned uh, graduates in Rensselaer, um, who has a tremendous history in his company and, and site engineering issues. Um, his company was a big player in the big dig in Boston. As a result, that pr all that effort provided the basis for seismic design considerations, foundation design, rock anchors, retaining walls, piles, floor slabs, etc. And it resulted in a site and structural design uh, that was innovative and extraordinary from a foundation and site and structural details. It also provided us with a clear understanding of the construction means and methods, risk mitigation, and ongoing site monitoring to effectively and safely build impact. And I will say, um, contrary to urban legend, impact's not sliding down the hill. When we were constructing impact, we never had a failure that was even remotely similar to a fear that the building was sliding down the hill. And in fact, we are quite confident uh, that one thing for sure, impact is pinned to the rock. When I said rock anchors, we're talking about anchors that were almost 300 feet deep that pinned the building and its foundation walls back to bedrock, uh, which is quite an extraordinary feature of it. Okay? But the final program, the world-class acoustics, the unique and customized design features, the required technology, equipment, and performance infrastructure, all and, and, and scope that we added that was outside the building, it all, and it all increased the building square footage to 221 square feet, and it all attributed to the final cost of impact. A final cost that was well within the benchmarks of the cost consultant for a building with a unique program and features such as impact. And I'd like to now turn it over to John Dordick. 
Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Claude. So I'm uh, John Dordick, the uh, Howard Eisman Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, uh, and I'm a special advisor to the President on Strategic Initiatives. And up until June, I was the Vice President for Research, and I've gone back to the faculty uh, where I started. So let me just address a number of key points. I'll, I'll deal with the research first, and then to get into some of the rankings. And I know that is of great interest to uh, all of you. It's also of great interest to my colleagues uh, on the faculty. So in the past several years, you know, this country has faced an unprecedented drop in federal funding. Uh, you know, we had the ARA funding, the stimulus packages that came through, and then dramatic sequestration occurred. And I know that many of you know all that. Uh, we're not alone. Every institution, from MIT at the top to the local colleges, have faced the same thing. And so the, that drop has forced universities to do a number of things. And I think one of the most important things is to increase funding in other areas. And we have focused on, because we're not a state institution, we focus on maybe the most important area for us, which is industry funding. And in fact, our industry funding now is roughly about 14% of our total mm -hmm. funding. The highest funding, industry funding of any uh, school in the country is MIT at about 18%. So we're around number two or three. Uh, in, the num in the percentage of industry funding uh, for research of a university in the U.S. Georgia Tech is somewhere around 11, Carnegie Mellon's around 10 percent. So that's a significant increase that we have focused on, again, because the federal government is essentially abdicating their responsibilities of funding significant basic research. Now, another thing that uh, struck me was this uh, graph that Renew Rensselaer has put up about expenditures and revenues. In fact, they're the same. Uh, they have to be. We're a nonprofit. What the difference occurs, it comes from, is simply due to the fact that we have internal funding that goes to research. Every institution has internal funding that goes to research. Part of that has to do with cost sharing because the federal government has increased that requirement of universities putting that in. Part of it goes to discretionary funding that chaired faculty like myself have that allows us to put towards graduate students, undergraduate students, and so forth. So that, in fact, our percentage of internal funding is about average. Uh, if you look at all the major institutions of research above us and many below us, the percentage of, in, of internal funding to research is pretty constant. And in some cases, there are schools that have dramatically higher internal funding. Our graduate PhD program is now growing. This past year, uh, the admission, and I believe today on campus, we have well over 900 PhD students. That was a focus for us, is to increase the PhD uh, student base, not so much the thesis-based master's programs, because it's the PhD programs that lead to the significant research. Now let me get into the rankings, because I know many people care about that. Many of my colleagues do that too. So, we dropped in the Carnegie classification. It's not a ranking, it's a classification. And there's a very simple reason we dropped, and that was because the metrics of how the Carnegie classification uh, was uh, worked cha uh, changed between five years ago and just a few years ago. What happened was that they dramatically increased the weighting that they gave to the non-science and engineering. Now, we're not a comprehensive research university. We don't have that much outside of science and engineering. Most of the technical STEM-based institutions are in the same position. Now let me tell you, an give you an example of a university like us that also dropped out. And that's Rockefeller University. And Rockefeller, just like us, doesn't really have much outside of the science, in their case mainly science, uh, and us science and engineering. They actually have a large number of Nobel Prize winners. They have the highest per capita funding of any institution in the country. That means per faculty basis. Uh, and they drop to an, uh, an R2, uh, indicating again, because they don't have non-science and engineering funding, non, no non-science, not significant amount of number of PhD students in those fields, they couldn't stay at R1. So we're not alone. And 
it's something that we are changing. We have been building up the non-science and engineering. We'll see where we go from there. In terms of the ranking of a university or the best colleges, we're back to 49. If you look at the metrics that go into that, there are a number of things that play a, a major role. One of the most significant ones is if you look at the, uh, the numbers, the absolute values of how we're rated, statistically they're within not even, uh, not even a standard deviation, they're way below that. So it's very easy to move up and down those rankings, whether that's in the U.S. News uh, rankings for best universities, whether it's in the School of Engineering, it's the same issue. So we're going to go up and down, and that's not uncommon. I think one of the, there are two areas, though, that do hurt us, even though we're trying to build in mm -hmm. metrics that we have greater control over, one of which is the alumni giving, which, as you pointed out, is low, which is really a shame. Uh, the other is that we have a, um, an unusual new student success ranking that came in. It has to do with Pell Grants versus the average. Again, all STEM institutions get hit by that. It's not clear where that's going to end up because it is a new ranking, but we'll see what happens. Finally, in engineering, I'll point out that at the graduate level, we are now number 42 uh, or 41, which is down a couple spots, but again, statistically irrelevant. From anywhere from 35 to 45, there's essentially no distinction between the schools. And one can move up and down for no reason whatsoever other than how you deal with the metrics. But I will say this, that if you look at every single graduate department, with the exception of biomedical engineering, all the individual departments are higher ranked, which indicates that our recognition by our peers actually is quite high. And in fact, biomed has, uh, as a percentile increase, there's just been an explosion in the number of biomedical and bioengineering departments uh, around the country. Finally, let me just address faculty stability, because I think that's an important issue. So the faculty departures in the last five years or so are actually below the national average. Uh, typically, 8, 9 percent of faculty depart for any, any number of reasons every year. We're around 7 percent. What has really affected us in the preceding 15 years, more than anything, is that there were essentially no hires or minimal hires made in the 80s and 90s and so people retired. And we've had uh, an amazing number of faculty that have been hired. The cost is great. It's a significant impact. But I will say one thing before leaving, and that is that uh, a good metric of how good the faculty are that we bring in is these, uh, what's called these NSF uh, Early Career Awards. And that indicates how competitive those young faculty are at receiving the recognition that we expect them to be able to, to, to receive. And in fact, we are on, an, on a per faculty basis number two in the country over the last 20 years. And it continues that way. Again, the only school higher than us is MIT. Not hard to do when you have a near $15 billion endowment. So let me now turn uh, this over to my colleague, John Wexler, who will talk about the enrollment aspects. So I get seven and a half? No. So I'm kidding. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Wexler. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment Management here at Rensselaer. I wanted to quickly go over where we stand. We've had a very exciting year for the fall of 2018. We received 20,405 applications for this incoming class. That's the largest volume of applications we've ever received. Just in comparison to 2000, that's a quadrupling the number of applications we've received at this institution. More importantly, we've had the largest incoming freshman class. We have 1,783 students that are enrolled. Of that group, you should know that 511 of them, which about 29%, are from early decision one or two. And I can get into what early decision one or two, but that means you're a destination institution for those schools. And when students apply, they, don't, they pull back their applications to other schools. The profile is fantastic for the incoming class that we have. We're at 1409 on an average SAT out of 1,600. Just to put in comparison, that compares to 1,282 in 2,000. Our acceptance rate is at 43%. Going back to 2,000, that would have been over 80%. So we, back in 2,000, we had about 5,500 5, applications. We were accepting 80% of the students that were coming in. The class profile is even more exciting. 
We've got more women than we've ever had in the history of Rensselaer in this incoming freshman class. We have 568 women in this class. That's over 32%, right at 32%. We have 283 underrepresented minorities. The diversity is obviously a very important thing for all academic institutions. 40% of our students come from outside the Northeast that are incoming freshman class. The reason that's very important, if any of you know demographics, the number of high school students graduating from the, in the Northeast will continue to go down between now and probably 2031. So we need to be outside the Northeast Obviously, we're well-known nationally, but Northeast is where historically, that number in the early 2000s was probably 80% of our students were from the Northeast. We've made a conscious decision in that. One of the things we've seen on campus when we talk about students coming from outside the Northeast, in any given year, we have 10,000 students, undergraduate, visiting. On a daily basis, you may see some of them today, it's because it's Columbus Day, it's a very popular day to visit. So our medalist numbers are up, and which is a big indicator of the quality of our students that are coming in. And I'll just touch on this. The two things I wanted to touch on is one of the things we find for our students that are interested is undergraduate research. We have oh, between 500 and 1,000 students at any time doing undergraduate research. One of the reasons our academic quality is so high is because students want to come here and do research at the undergraduate level and at the yield level. We are at 21% for this incoming class. Obviously, we'd love for that to go up. The number one factor that would help us go up is improve the financial aid packages. The, number, the schools that you saw up there, virtually all of them meet 100% in need. We are not able to do that with the endowment we have today. So with more giving, that would help us for that. And finally, we do a lot of events, admissions events around the country. And I want to thank those here and that are watching, the alumni that help us at those events. They have a huge impact, and I thank you very much for that, those efforts. And now, that's the fastest I've ever done anything. I'm going to hand it over to Lenormand. Strong. I just want to say we have four minutes remaining. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Lenormand James Strong, and I am the interim vice president for student life. That went half my time, right? I'm going to make two major points with you. One, about the importance of the union. I grew up in unions. I was president of the Association of College Unions International. I came here in part because I want to support the union. We're doing a great job with the union. The first thing that we can do to make a difference in a lot of the concerns you bring into the room is we've got to get that union by uh, constitution aligned with the bylaws of the institute. I don't know what happened over the last 15 years but they aren't. We're going to do that. The new director, Dr. Charlie Potts, is doing a wonderful job with the union. Some of the governance issues that are a concern is we had to comply uh, with uh, outside regulations, as you've heard about. Right now, we're in full compliance with the NCAA and middle states, and we're going to continue to work with that. We're also working hard with our student leaders to make improvements in some of the relationship issues uh, that you've written about. Second point, uh, student elections. We had some problems. I appreciate those of you who wrote me about it. Students brought issues to our attention. We engaged some auditors to look at it. We are expecting the audit report any moment now. What we're going to do with that audit report is to give it to our student leaders. We're going to go through it in detail support them in the changes that they will make to improve their system. But we have to make sure that we have a system that is secure and reliable. That will give our students the tool that they need, and we're looking forward to supporting them as they undertake that good work. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about student conduct. There is a lot of confusion about the process. Rensselaer subscribes to an educational process. The first point of follow-up when a complaint is raised is something that we call an inquiry, fact-finding, if you will, where students are asked about the particulars and where necessary we provide education and information, and if required, then sanctions take place. With that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to my colleague, 
Assistant Vice President Travis Apgar and Dean of Students, who will talk about some of the specifics. Oh, we don't have time. Okay, then it's to Richie. One minute remaining, but there were a few interruptions, so we'll go over a few seconds. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, everyone. And good morning. Um, first of all, it's really wonderful to see so many people that I met at Reunion and that I've spoken to over the last couple of years since I've been here. Um, I won't go through all the introductions because I think my name has been said about three times already. Um, what I'd like to say is this, though. Um, I appreciate the presentations um, that you gave, um, both Bill and um, John. I really do. I've actually studied the website very deeply. Sure, okay. I thought I had the people that said enough. My name is Richie Hunter, and I'm the Vice President for Strategic Communications and External Relations. So I really do appreciate it. I studied it. And what I will say is, while data can be accurate, the context and the framework to which it's put matters. And some of the information is misleading. I'll just give you one quick example because we just finished speaking about rankings. Rensselaer has been ranked in the top 50 of all national universities for the last 19 years. That is something to be proud of. And you showed how we're, we're working against major headwinds, lack of philanthropy from, in an extensive way. No one disputes that. But also suffering through and managing through and surviving through major financial downturns, the dot-com fallout, as well as the Great Recession. And we powered through, remained in, as a top institution. So you've heard today, we have quadrupled enrollments in the last 19 years. Demand is up. Quality is up, and not, excuse me, not enrollments, applications. But our, our enrollment is also the highest it's been for undergraduates since the inception of the university. The quality of our students are up. The quality of our programs are up. We've had 22 new academic programs in the last 19 years. So one of the things is that we invested in the Rensselaer plan, unanimously approved by the board, a holistic and comprehensive plan that engaged all stakeholders within the Rensselaer community on some level and we've held ourselves to those commitments. So we also have outcomes for our students, and we haven't talked about outcomes, but our students are some of the highest paid people in the, in, that come out of college in terms of graduation and their first salaries. You can look it up, the stats are out there. Our students go to some of the best graduate schools to pursue their education beyond undergraduate, their undergraduate education. We also have strengthened the faculty. We've refreshed, we've renewed, because the world is moving, and someone said this earlier, in different directions. If we wouldn't have invested in platforms like Sizzle, like Biotech, we'd be left behind. And what did the great American general say? If you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. So we've made sure that we continue to be relevant. So I can go through the list of things in terms of what we've done, but we have strengthened as an institution, both financially and with internal controls. Our finances are stabilized. You heard Barbara Howe say and share, and you can look it up. And I know that we have some really great researchers here. Um, but we've achieved the crossover, and that was a big deal for us. Because a couple of years ago, we had a gap of $100 million, and that has changed. How has that changed? It's changed by disciplined fiscal management. It's changed because, I'll tell you, on this side of the room that you see, and all throughout the campus, you're gonna find hardworking people who are absolutely dedicated to making sure that this university thrives. We're working with students every day that we believe in. 
We're supporting and promoting researchers and professors every day that we believe in, and we are making change. What we do here matters. It absolutely matters. Rensselaer is known for working on some of the hardest problems and challenges that our world faces. And you remember, Tony, we spoke about this about a, a week and a half ago when we sat next to each other at the Patroon's breakfast. So I think that's my, my time to move on. But I do want to say one thing. And I am passionate about this. And some people say, well, you guys are speaking about all of the good things. That's because there are a lot of good things. That's because we're working hard to make sure that that happens. And I share with you, John, that it is disturbing to see our alumni participation rates in terms of giving stop. But I don't think that telling alumni not to give helps that. I actually think it hurts it. And it's not about giving in terms of the really huge gifts. It's about being engaged and caring enough that you put your time, your treasure, and your talent where your words are. Because we're not what we say we're gonna do, we're what we do. And so if we really are on the same page and we care about students, and we care, I'm gonna finish my sentence. You know what? Look, Thank you, uh, thank you, Richie, rest of the administration. We, uh, we have reached our uh, Q&A period. I know Richie was in the middle of a sentence. Does anybody have a question to continue that, that statement? Okay, question in the back. When did Richie Rensselaer ever say not to go to the RBI? State your name in the uh, class. Um, why don't you read through all of their website? I made the website, and I know. And, and read through. So, you know, so let me say, let me say something. First of all, I actually am take, I take this seriously. I, 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 I take the work that we're doing at this university very seriously. So in terms of laughing at something like that, this is really serious business. And if we are really on the same page, then this should be serious to everyone. Now, if you have not seen where we have campaigns, and let's bring up Save the Union, encouraging students not to attend here, and encouraging alumni not to, not to not donate. Here. We're not here. This is not Save the Union. Save the Union's here. Where are they? Where's Michael? There he is. We have one he's not so, so anyway, let me, let me finish, okay? Let me finish. Because we already know that there is an integration that exists there. Please, please, oh, yeah, do yeah, not, yeah, yeah. do not, do not, read the website. Read the website. Yes. Well, does, does someone have a question for me? I mean, I'm seeing these hands go up. I'm, you know what? I'm finished with that. I'm finished with that. I want to um, the October 2017 rally to save the union, and I was shocked to a find that one third of the campus was blocked off to the students on the campus, and then I was even more shocked to find how afraid they were to, of losing financial aid for going to that rally, and I personally took umbrage of seeing RPI pay $10,000 to the Troy police to come on campus armed and then take pictures of our students. I thought that was outrageous, and I'd like the, an explanation of why that is cherishing the students, putting value to them. So the, My name is Mike so, Keenan, and I'm class of 1971. Travis, again. Okay. And wait, wait, let's, let's repeat the question. For everyone who did not hear. No, no, no. You're not running this. Actually, do we have another, do we have another microphone? Thank you, Richard. Is there another microphone? Well, I, I'll badly repeat it. We heard it. 
Mike Keenan, class of 1971. I want to understand how RPI can treat their students the way they did. I went to the demonstration last year, 2017, during alumni weekend, and I was shocked to find that one third of the campus was blocked off from the students on the campus, and then they were afraid to express their displeasure in losing control of the union. And the worst part was that RPI had spent, I believe, $10,000 to bring the Troy police, who were not only armed, they were filming the students. These students were terrorized by, by being afraid of losing financial aid. I depended a lot on scholarship when I was here. I went to demonstrations. I never worried about anything but keeping my QPA up. And I want to know why things have changed so drastically. Thank you. So good morning, folks. I'm Travis Apker. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Life, Dean of Students. I appreciate your question. In October 2017, uh, same date as the, the gala kickoff for the uh, capital campaign, uh, there was one, uh, one request for a peaceful demonstration on our campus. It was denied because of the space that they wanted to place it in, as well as all of the other activities surrounding that very large campus event. Uh, we did offer, I did personally offer, in the response given to that individual to come in, have a conversation about where we might accommodate. Uh, actually reached out multiple times and invited that person in with no response. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little bit of a sore throat. Um, sir, I'm not, I'm not sure why uh, any student would think that their financial aid would be in jeopardy when we're actually doing a great deal more uh, to, to generate financial aid, in, in, including one third of what we're trying to do, uh, one pillar of these three pillars of the transformational campaign. But let me just, uh, before I turn it over to John, very quickly state about the, about the protest. Uh, we, okay, so, so we actually uh, have Troy police and others on campus for large events all the time. Uh, they, I think, on a standard basis, wear body cameras. Uh, this, you know, I think you're, you're uh, attributing it to being on our campus. They didn't have body cameras, they had actual cameras. No. 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 We have an obligation to make sure that our campus is safe at all times, especially during events like this where we, we know that we're using multiple buildings, it's a large venue, uh, and if you were present, you know that students in large broke through the, uh, the fencing that we had up that was demarcating the area that we needed to make sure was, was open for things like uh, safety transportation, fire uh, lanes, and, and so forth. So, um, okay. I'll turn it over to I see 10 seconds. In my, my, I'm John Wexler again. In my role, I oversee admissions and financial aid. No student lost financial aid because of their protesting. The fear was there. No student lost. Let's go back to the point. The, the statement was made that students lost financial aid. No. Okay. Okay. No student lost financial aid. Okay, I'm going to alternate, as I mentioned before. And so... Is it, this is actually more of a comment, and the reason I'm going to this one is it has the uh, highest popularity. Uh, this is from uh, Terry Jones, 66, 72 grad. This is actually more of a comment, but it says the administrative speakers are presenting positive facts, but are not addressing the metrics that the petitioners show the reason for having this meeting with administration present. I uh, wanted to know if there was a, a comment to uh, address that. What's the question? I want to know if there's uh, any additional facts that can be shared. I've got a question related to that. Uh, and I think it's really, it's really related to will there be a summary of the data, I, of the points that were made. I, I, can, I can enlighten him on that. Um, well, that, that was more for... Oh. Why is that, well, was it directed, was it directed at presenters? Or, um, I, as I think you know, I'm, I come from a financial background. I'm very financial statement oriented. I was very encouraged to hear numbers cited that are coming from the yet posted 2018 financial statements. Uh, we were cited statistics from the June 30 balance sheet. And I look forward to seeing that when that becomes publicly available and we will update our charts and then 
the, com the person commenting will be able to see the data. Okay, so I have one, two, three, Actually, Sheila, you had your, your hand up. So, I was, well, Sheila's after you. Okay. Um, oh, actually, here's the mic. Right here. <clears throat> and again, make sure the, uh, I'll put it up so everyone can see. Uh, Greg Moore, class of 90, and I'm reminded of a quote from one of my favorite movies, uh, never go up against an RPI grad when data's on the line. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, the administration officials who are here, but I kind of share what that comment made uh, concern that lots of positive comments made but didn't really address some of the insular, uh, the new insular uh, concerns. And the question that I had was, you know, it, it sounded like we were being blamed for not donating enough money. And I want to know, speaking as alumnus, how can we expect to contribute when we're called racist, sexist, and heightist? I think most of us remember that letter. And that was sent out by a member of the administration and also uh, the student union was told in part that student, that uh, the administration had to review them because of the concerns about their finances. Given the student union finances over the past 30 years compared to the administration's, I think perhaps the student union should be taking over their administration finances. <laughs> Thank you. Was there uh, any responses? Actually, uh, Sheila was next. I'd like to know whether or not the space, the alternate space that was recommended to the students who wanted to protest had equal visibility to the alumni. Where you wanted to put them, were they still visible to the alumni? Because that was their purpose, was to get their concern out in front of the alumni, including those attending the gala. And yet the administration took down posters so the alumni could not see the student protest. And I'm curious to know whether or not the student protest would have been, had they taken up your alternate position, still visible to the alumni attending the, the gala. So I do want to have questions related to the topics. Okay. So the student union. That was your absolutely. I can answer fairly quickly. Because the student never responded, we never had a conversation about exactly where we would have an alternate site. We would have worked through that as we what we have in the past and we will in the future. Any posters that were taken down, by the way were taken out because they were viol in violation of the, the university poster policy. Okay, and it, is, that, is it Ira? It is. I'm going to go to you after I take one of the comments from here. Okay, this is from uh, David Gertler, 8384. I'd like to hear the strategies Greg mentioned, Greg used to mention regarding improving the percentage, alumni percentage participation rate. I'm happy to share one. We actually have, there's a series of companies that we're working with that actually have large populations of your alumni and alumnae in those companies. And actually they're interested in actually forming company chapters. And so one of the things that we're doing <coughs> is working with those companies and there's about um, 10 or so of them that have about 8,000 alumni in those and they want to be engaged and they've asked to be engaged. And so like the programs that we're bringing like uh, Global Game Changers and uh, Class Alive and, and the uh, Red Talks, we're actually going to be bringing those into the companies as well. And so those are uh, companies like Boeing, companies like IBM, your larger companies who are participating. And they are looking, they don't necessarily have a connection with their chapter, if you would, in the region, but they do. <coughs> so we're working with those companies. And that's one of the strategies. Yep. Yeah, well, so so there are a couple of things that we're doing. Uh, in New York City, we actually have a growing population of individuals that are very interested in the institution. We actually, we're standing up a, sorry? Hard to hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so we're actually standing up a uh, executive council in New York City, which actually has come together to um, bring other alumni into the uh, conversation and actually help develop program that's relevant in the New York City area. We're doing the same thing in Boston and also the same thing in the Silicon Valley. And it's been very successful in the Silicon Valley, 
and same thing in New York City, every event that we've done around the Global Game Changers are things that is an affinity to what, toward what our alumni or alumni are involved with industry-wise are very successful, and that's the strategy that we're using. Right. Thank you, Greg. Excuse me, sir. I believe I was next. Okay, I'll get you at the Ira. Ira had his hand up earlier as well. Okay. <laughs> I might forget Ira. Thank no, you very I'm kidding. Much, yeah, I'll get you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Good morning. My name is Louise Bergendahl. I'm from the class of 99 and 01. I would like to thank Renew Rensselaer for taking their time to prepare and come here and present. And I would also like to thank the administration for their time and efforts to come here and, and present as well. I have to say that as an alumna of RPI, I'm saddened and disappointed uh, with the information that was presented by the administration today. Uh, I believe that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Renew, Re Renew Rensselaer and the administration had exactly the same amount of time to prepare for this meeting, to present as much information as possible to alumni and alumni like myself to help us in supporting the school as best that we can. I would like to comment on some of the numbers that were given. I did some quick calculations in my notebook here, and it seems as though this year has a 20% yield, less than 20% yield from student enrollment to talk to the numbers that were presented from Renew Rensselaer. That does not seem to be an improvement from a yield standpoint, although numbers were given that they were very good for enrollment and that we had the highest number of applications supported. Um, my question to the administration is, Given the points that Renew Rensselaer has presented, will the administration be talking to or presenting any type of presentation to be put with this talk uh, to talk to the items that they did present at the meeting here? And will there be any data or charts to support the information that they had given to us so that the alumni re may review that information and compare things and make decisions on their own? Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for your commentary. So one of the decisions we made as an administration was that we took each of the points that were presented to us from the RAA and we wanted to come and in the flesh speak about them and answer questions about them. We put out information on a regular basis about the performance of the institution. Just this last, what my days are running into each other, but the Saturday during reunion and homecoming, the president gave a full state of the institute address, as she always does, that is posted on the website, that is, it's going to be sent out actually today to all of the campus community, and every time, holds herself to answer any questions. We do that with the fall town meeting, we do it with the spring town meeting, we do it with the state of the institute to the alumni. So in terms of a tit for tat, we actually want to believe that we're all working towards the same thing. And the information is there, and you know, we can, there's no hiding of that. But in terms of creating a presentation against what we don't even know, what's gonna, you know, what we're addressing, we didn't do that. But it's not out of disrespect. Actually, the fact that we're here this morning, this is really important to us, and it's out of full respect. The question is, will you put something together after the meeting that will be available for all alumni to look at? Well, the things that we have yes, are no, available no. now. They're already there. That's the answer. Here. Where? Where? Why, they, why weren't they presented? Look on the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look on the website. <laughs> How are you doing? And then I want to remind those uh, who are submitting questions on Slido, uh, please put in your uh, name in class here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ira Tickell, class of 76, 77, and a prior Grand Marshal. Um, I want to thank John and company for a very well presented, factually based presentation. I want to thank the administration, but uh, I think what we heard was a lot of apple pie and motherhood, and with all due respect, the anchoring of the MPEC Center to the bedrock, I don't think really had to do with the issues at hand. The one, and, and we can talk about finances, but what 
really irks me, and I think many other people here, was one particular bullet item, and that's about the union. And what's happening in terms of the administration and how the administration is approaching the management and ownership of the union today. I'm not aware of any legal issues that preclude what we've done for decades, which is having run the union by the president of the union and the finances run by the students. There's incredible precedence to this. I'm not aware of any issues that surround changing that. And to me, it's almost like a land grab. And it's very frustrating. Uh, and I think it needs to be addressed. The other frustration, with all due respect, and that, that's, I, want to make sure we get I, I understand. I see the clock ticking. But you have a lot of people here who are passionate about how they feel. I think to, to simply put a clock on it is a mistake as well. M my point being, we're actually limited on the now we have pretty, uh, I'm so not sure I understand why, but okay. So well, my well, issue well, is about the union. Let me get a and so we'll stick around after 1030. The live stream will stop, stop at 1030. Perfect. Well, if I could just. <laughs> Go ahead. Wait, wait, what was it? The union. Okay. And it doesn't have to be answered today, but I think the administration has to answer to that. Well, let me, let me start by saying that the, the, you know, ours is, is a very unique student union in the fact that it's one of the very few that's student-run. Well, we and by, and we agree. And by student-run, look, students are, play a major role in setting operational policy, executing and planning programs, uh, managing the operational funding of, of uh, per, of student organizations. Hiring the director? None of that's changed. In fact, we just hired uh, a fantastic director. <laughs> so we just hired a fantastic director. And I think that part of the reason that we had such, uh, such great results was because we had student involvement throughout that process, increasing the transparency of the process, increasing the amount of student input through that process. And we have Dr. Charlie Potts, who's already come here has a, a great working relationship with our students who were, who were uh, you know, already investigating the next phase of, of uh, renovations and, and, um, and, and working closely with them with his expertise in that area. So, you know, the student-run student union is still a student-run union. Okay. Now, one second. Let me get a name. So, I had uh, uh, Doug. Doug Haskell. Hold on. So, I had Doug, I had Colleen, and then... Yes. Well, we're eating up time for the overall meeting. So I'm going to get to Doug next. Thank you. Uh, I'm Doug Hasbrook. I'm uh, class of 1957 and 67, and uh, might have been 77, except I couldn't get a thesis off the ground while traveling four days a week. So. Um, this is not easy for me. I love this place. I have always loved this place. It owes me, or I owe it a lot, all right? And I will always owe it a lot, as will my family and many, many of my friends. I have a question, but I'm going to preface it with a couple of comments. I'm a life patroon. I've been a donor to the annual fund for something probably approaching 35 years. I've been involved in fundraising in every dimension you can imagine, basically, at the levels that I can afford to be. <coughs> for probably 35 years. I have worked with Rent Exchange, I have worked with phonathons, I have worked with people all over the world in fundraising. I've also been the communicating, uh, what we call the networking guru for my class for probably close to 40 years. So I communicate with something that's still probably in the range of 300 people from the class of 1957 all the time. In fact, I sent the entire class uh, an email last night on a, a topic that we've uh, found that I thought would be of interest to them. So I talked to a lot of alums 
all right? Most of my class, but a lot of other people as well. For the last several years, I was involved with fundraising, uh, making phone calls for the patroon level gifts, people that uh, give roughly in the range of $2,000 a year. I'd done that for four or five years. When the letter that was this gentleman referred to was sent out to alumni uh, sometime late last year, or early this year, I don't remember the exact timing, but when that letter from the faculty member was forwarded to alums, I think you all saw it, I had on my desk a packet of about 20 phone calls that I was supposed to make on behalf of the annual fund. I had promised the people in the development office I would do that as I had done every year. When I got that letter, I laid that packet aside and I bit my tongue for probably a couple of weeks, thinking, what do I do? I know, I'm, I'm almost done, okay? But I'm biting my tongue and I'm thinking, what do I, what do, I do? And I talked with my family and I talked with my friends, and I decided to send that packet back to the development office, and I did not make any phone calls, and I explained to them why. And I can tell you with the people that were my class that I talked to about that one issue, there were several times when people were saying to me, somebody should have been fired when that letter went out. Somebody, we don't know who, but somebody should have been fired. So my question for the administration is simply this. Why was that letter forwarded to the alumni? And what was your expectation when that letter was forwarded to the alumni? What did you expect us to do? So Dr. Beisgroff's email was sent out and because it was a conversation around campus. Wow. Dr. Beisgroff's email was sent out and I did send that email out. It wasn't a condemnation of what anyone was. It was a conversation going all over campus. And so the conversation was to get that email out to everyone. It was not saying what anyone was or doesn't, but it was part of the conversation. And so- I'm not challenging the, the no. professor's point no. of view. He's entitled to his point of view. Yes, he is. He and and that was- email to other faculty members if he chose to do that. And it was going he all over. He didn't send it to alumni, the administration. The administration did, and I did. Why? 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 Someone wanted to understand about the resolution, so I just wanted to clarify that it was more of a recommendation to the RAA board to consider the information presented by the petitioners. Okay, next up I have Colleen. And we have uh, just a couple minutes left. Hi, Colleen Costello, class of 2012, one of the RAA board members here today. I want to, sure. I want to thank the administration for joining this morning, especially the participation level that we have um, early on a Columbus Day morning, as well as the passionate alumni here, for which I know everyone's shared goal is to continue to make Rensselaer better. I did note that during Ren Renew Rensselaer's presentation, a, a continued theme that you had, John, was around um, some of the financial burdens that perhaps were hamstringing some of the investments that might be needed to meet some of the goals that are both in the Rensselaer plan and both that you addressed. So just in listening to the administration's um, presentation, I had just had a specific question for Curtis. Um, it seemed like one of the burdens that was discussed or at least specifically called out was the Legacy Pension Fund. So you had cited that before 1999, it was about $15 million total. So I was just curious, in what period of time? I assume that's not since inception. So what period of time was that? And then the $230 million was 1999 till today. Do you know what the final term obligation for that is and what the rate of diminishment is? Is it tapering off? Is that going to increase? If that's something you can share publicly, that just seemed to be a, a burden that would be great to address. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The um, $15 million was do since the inception of the plan. Now, the $230 million that we've invested in the plan uh, will diminish the liability. And there are three factors that we're looking at. One is how we invest the funds in the plan. Number two, 
we looked at the number of participants that were contributing to the plan, went from zero, went from 6% to 0%, which caused a major issue. Plus, there were a number of features put in the plan tied to tying their benefits to the S&P, which, as you know, the S&P went up over the past few years and which really increased the liability of the plan. So we put a hedge against that in the future. People are living older, and there's a new liability due to that in which we are addressing. So these are some of the issues that we're dealing with. Well, we're, we're hoping that we can get this plan fully funded within the next five years. Can you give us some data versus time on the, on the gross numbers you cited? On the time? Can you talk about yeah, we, we put in $15 million a yeah, year. I can give you I can give you those numbers. I don't have them right here to, to give you, but I can give you the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on for a second. So we're at uh, 1030 and I believe RPI TV, we need to end the stream now. Why? We can go longer? Do they need the room or what? No, no, it's for the stream. We're okay? How much, how much more time do we have? We keep going? All right, good. All right. All right, so we're going to keep going. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm going uh, to address an, another item from uh, Nagesh Rao, and actually this is in my text. Nagesh, I believe, is a class of 2002. Uh, what steps to take to find a way for us all to work together between uh, Renewer and Salir, the administration, and REA? And part of that, it was contained within the resolution for the REA to review those items. And what I stated, the purpose of the REA, that's also involved of working with the administration and all alumni as well. So this, these are the type of items we've already been addressing. We've had meetings with the administration. We've had uh, meetings with different alumni groups, alumni, also student groups. So this is an ongoing topic. We shared in our latest message that came out Tuesday last week of some of the things that the REA is working on. And part of that is uh, addressing the concerns coming from alumni. So that's part of the next steps that we're working for. That was the purpose of this meeting to get the, the concerns out there, and then we addressed it about what are we gonna do next. So your comments, everyone's comments are welcome. Someone asks how can they be involved. It's also going to our website. We have our email address up there. You can send uh, your recommendations or other requests. You can come to our meetings. When uh, is the next meeting? The next meeting will be uh, January during the uh, big Red Freak Out weekend, so that last weekend in January. Now, we also have an annual meeting in November, and that announcement will be coming out soon. And that will be here on campus? Yes, but also we'll have the option for uh, members to uh, watch remotely, or, or participate remotely, and also be able to vote remotely as well. Is it posted on the website so it's easily found? Yes, yeah, so it'll be posted on the website, just like this meeting. Yeah, actually, th this meeting is on the website. That's how a lot of people are able to RSVP. Hard to find. Okay. So next I'll go to Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Feinstein, uh, in class of 77. I had the honor of serving as Grand Marshal. I also had the honor of serving as RAA President in the, in the mid-90s. So I'm passionate about Rensselaer. I've always been passionate about Rensselaer. And it's very concerning to me that we are at this point. Uh, I think that uh, it's important that uh, the administration understand that we are here because we are passionate about Rensselaer, and we only want the best for Rensselaer. And it's wonderful that, you, that good things are happening, but you really didn't address the concerns that uh, we knew Rensselaer brought to our attention. Uh, the numbers, the uh, concerns on the fin from the financial standpoint, those need to be worked on, and I hope the RAA uh, will, will be a, uh, an honest broker in, uh, in these discussions. My concern, 
uh, given my background, is in student governance. And it's not the same. Uh, I, as, as Grand Marshal, I met with the President, George Lowe, on a monthly basis. And we had, we, had, we had formal meetings set up once a month. But often, in between formal meetings, I would get a phone call, the president wanted to chat, he had a question, he wanted to know what the students thought, things like that. Uh, I, as president of REA, yeah, so I, I'll get to the question. Don't worry, I'll get so, to so it. I well, I, I just want to yeah. a quick reminder for everyone that we are limiting questions to 30 seconds, so we want to be able to get, there's a lot, a lot of you have questions, so I want to make sure we get to you. The question probably less than 30 seconds. Uh, the RAA, when I worked with uh, President Pipes, also there was a good relationship with the president, we had with the administration. I'm very concerned that today's students are not getting the ability to be a voice with the future of Rensselaer, and I'm very concerned that the alumni are not getting a very strong voice about the future of the, of the school. And I, I question the RAA, I'll put the question to you, okay. to make sure, you know, and I ask that, that, that you and the RAA board and the, and the members of today's board, uh, I ask that you, you know, the question is, how honest are you going to be? I know you will be very honest, but I also, uh, the energy and how, it's, it's not just coming from a small group of Renew Rensselaer. This is from a very broad and a very concern of many, many alumni. So you asked about how honest will we be? We're not trying to be untruthful at all. Whatever we share, that's the whole reason why we wanted this meeting, so we can all get together. Even before it was petitioned, I already had discussions with Bill about having this meeting. We didn't actually need a special a petition to have this meeting. I was working on setting it up without a petition. So that. I, I just want to make sure that is clear. Uh, uh, Bill and others were not denied. What I looked at was opportunity for us to get together as a group. That's part of the purpose of the RAA, is to help facilitate these kind of discussions. And so I did not need a special meeting to do that. Uh, and I wasn't trying to deny anyone from coming to RAA board meetings. What we thought was more uh, pertinent was to have administration representative based on these topics these aren't topics that can just be addressed by the RAA. The RAA wants to help, as you men mentioned, communicating and giving the voice of alum, but we also uh, need to know the specific data and facts around these topics. And so that's what we're working on, helping to communicate. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but there's been more messages coming from the RAA than you've probably received before. And that's because we are trying to make sure we're addressing those concerns. And that's what we'll continue to do. This is just the beginning. We're, we've been working on how do we improve our overall communication and engagement with alum and help uh, everyone gain a better understanding of, one, our alma mater that everyone, as you mentioned, we're very passionate about, but also how can we play a part in uh, bridging the, those gaps. Thank you. Okay. I wrote down Jerry. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jerry Sweeney. Gerald's my given name. Um, we just had our class of 68, 50th reunion. I would tell you the issues raised by Renew Rensselaer were a point of contention. Some people believed it. Some people supported it. A lot of the information is supported by accurate data. I think what we have to do to come out of it, and the issues are very complicated. And as the administration pointed out, there's a lot of good things to say about the school. We have issues. You have to deal with the issues. The Rensselaer Alumni Association has stepped in uh, as a result of the petition and said, we want a process to look at these issues, bring them to the forefront, and get a resolution. First, of the identification, what are the problems? Are these problems or are they not problems? So I would resolve in the first instance, make a resolution that the <coughs> Re I Alumni Association establish a task force to work with administration 
we knew Rensselaer and other people interested to bring some uh, clarity in the facts and some of the recommendations. I'm supporting what, uh, what uh, one of the other uh, alumni, alumni had said. And, and I think that's where we have to go forward. Right now, this has created a disturbance in the space. It, it, it impacts on everything, but the issues are important for the survival, the reputation, and the integrity of the university. And the reputation, all alumni and alumni, I think there should be one word to cover it all, but, uh, but, but all are impacted by that. Anyone who still works or cites the uh, RPI on their resume has to be impacted. So I resolved that we uh, go forward. And second, I ask that the administration demonstrate the transparency that's really essential to resolve this issue. That was a resolution, so you have to, anyone will second it. So uh, I mentioned before, uh, so with the uh, special meeting, uh, the RA board is taking recommendations. And so that's a very good recommendation that we're going to take forward and discuss. Yeah, so there was, it was moved to have a, for the, uh, moved for the REA to re recommend putting together a task force to work with the administration, uh, Renew Rensselaer, and REA board. Second it for the record, John Templin. Okay. So this is just a show of hands, like, who supports that? Okay. Anybody opposes? Okay. And that's something that, again, it, uh, this, that carries, and that's, uh, again, that's just a recommendation for the RAA board to consider. Okay. Next, I have Michael. Hello. I am uh, Michael Gardner, class of 2017, 2018. Um, some of you might know of me from my antics with Save the Union. Uh, just to clarify your comment, uh, Richie, um, Save the Union is a student group. I am no longer a student. I have not done anything since becoming an alum with Save the Union, besides being on public sidewalks. Save the Union is not a recognized student group. Okay. There are students. <laughs> Any rate, excuse me. Any rate to go further, um, just to make sure the record stands for knowledge and thoroughness for our motto here. Um, Dean Apgar, when you were talking about the student not responding, that's incorrect. Brian Johns did respond to you. He forwarded me his emails. If anyone would like to see them as evidence, I have them on my phone. And then um, second thing for protest fence, um, that was also incorrect because the fence was advertised as for fireworks beforehand. Then after the protest that happened, it was then classified to prevent the protest. And I have evidence on my computer over here. So if anyone would like to see that, I have it over here in my backpack. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, no, my only question was like, if anyone wants to see evidence, you're welcome to after the meeting. Okay. Next, I have uh, Lewis. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Louis Bolera. I'm a member of the class of 64. So I have a point of view that hasn't been represented in the discussion here, that of the faculty. Uh, I just retired from Cornell uh, University after having been on their faculty for 50 years. So I've been watching RPI from not very far away for a long time. And uh, you might be interested to know how RPI is received in the research community. and, and it, pretty much is not, okay? It's, uh, except for three people that were on the faculty when I was here 55 years ago, and uh, one other, I don't, I've never come across names of RPI faculty as being uh, important in research. And it, it always saddened me, frankly, you know, it's, because uh, I know people who, I know lots of people who went to MIT and they're very proud of it, and they have good reason to be. Uh, people who went to Caltech, people who went to Carnegie, Carnegie is amazingly uh, uh, important. I mean, they, you know, had John Nash, uh, the Nobel winner, as one of its undergraduates. So for a long time, Carnegie has been a player. Uh, right now, it's got the best computer science department in the country. Not in engineering school, it's in the country. You know, better than Stanford, probably better than MIT, Harvard, but not a player. 
Okay, so, uh, you know, I, you know I, I have much more to say than 30 seconds will allow, but let me just give you one, one point. Uh, I was here for my 50th reunion, you know, four years ago, and, you know, it was all MPAC all the time. You know, we saw this building, we saw MPAC, we saw the alumni, so the alumni center, we saw the stadium. Uh, a month later, I came back professionally and gave a lecture in the math department, which was my, my alma mater department. Uh, they had moved from uh, the Carnegie Building to Amos Eaton a few years after I left, and it looks like nothing has happened to that building since then. Uh, I've talked to the faculty that I talked to were demoralized. Uh, they had to fire their computer support specialist because of budget concerns, and this is a department that emphasizes computation. The one person I talked to who was able to compute was, uh, in fact, had an account at SUNY Albany that he was using. And I just think that's appalling. Okay. Just a second. And uh, the one thing that's important, and this has to do with facilities, the building is not ADA compliant. You know, if you know what that means, you know, it doesn't satisfy the rules of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990. It doesn't have an elevator. It has classrooms on the second floor. Students with disabilities, I guess, have to take classes in other buildings. I, I asked faculty people that I know, how do they handle office hours? And they say, well, we have a disabled student now, and he has to make arrangements to meet a faculty member in a different building. So, uh, so I think it's time that, you know, that building and maybe other academic buildings be brought up. Be brought All right. Up thanks. Thank, thanks, Louis. So it, it sounded like you, you, you had a couple questions. One was towards faculty, so we'll have John Dordick for that. And then you also had a question around facilities around Claude Brown. So, I mean. But let me point, before you answer me, the one thing I've noticed over this faculty growth for the last 18 years is recently the increase in, uh, in uh, career awards. I, I really noted that that it's finally, finally you're, you're making a mark that hasn't been shown. I haven't, I haven't been terribly impressed by the, the uh, kinds of appointments that were being made at a senior level. I've been involved with many universities that were trying to up their game, and this one was not so, being very serious about it. Yeah, well, l let me just address uh, you know, a few things. So, obviously faculty are well-versed in their own areas, uh, and I can't speak specifically to the math or applied math programs over the years, but I will say this, that if you take a look at the increase in the number of major national awards our faculty are, are winning, uh, the increase in the funding, uh, the recognition that the faculty have at the national level, uh, the significant impact that it's having in starting new ventures as well yeah. as in uh, being major uh, advisors to new ventures, uh, it has gone up significantly. Uh, you know, we have had a major change in the number of faculty over time. In fact, we've hired more faculty than we have on campus right now, mainly because, uh, again, as I said, in the 80s and 90s, we didn't hire. And so the demographics obviously worked against us. But the bottom line is that, as a whole, the faculty have dramatically increased in terms of recognition. Uh, the fraction of faculty doing active research, which is a major part of recognition, is higher today than ever before. Uh, and I would say that you're raising an issue that is important. Amos Eaton may not be a very good building. Well, the whole point that we need to, fo to follow through with here, all of you need to follow through, for all the faculty, for the students today and tomorrow, is that's what this campaign's about. Hire more faculty, it's expensive because the startup packages are very expensive to be competitive. Get more support to the students because they need it. And the federal government's not gonna provide as much support as they should. And finally, let's build out the facilities like the Science Center, which will in fact provide exactly the kinds of support that's needed. But I will say again, back to the beginning, uh, I am finding it a little shocking that you think that we're not successful as a faculty. Uh, I know we have other faculty members here and they may say the same thing. Uh, we're always looking to improve, hire the best senior faculty, hire the best junior faculty. We've been successful in hiring senior faculty, uh, and we can point to any number of different departments that have done the same thing. Thanks, John. And then before I get to the Claude, so we do have to uh, close out uh, members of the administration and others um, have to have hard stops and we did exceed our time that we had originally set for the meeting. So I do appreciate everyone staying longer than originally planned. 
And I had two more questions uh, after Claude. So it was Michael and Wade, and that's where I had my, uh, my cue cut off at. Uh, thank you. Rental air, like universities and colleges throughout the country, are under the supervision of the uh, United States Department of Education um, from a, an NADA perspective. And in fact, uh, we get, audit, get audited by the uh, Department of Education on an ongoing basis. And we have made a number of, uh, a, a, a number of the capital improvements that we have been made have been related to ADA features. But uh, you, you know the campus and you know that some of our buildings are old and uh, predate the requirements uh, for uh, modification <coughs> for compliance. And Amy Seaton is one of those buildings. And in those circumstances, we work with a individual student who, who perhaps has a mobility issue, and we, are, uh, we work to make reasonable accommodations uh, for that student. And in every case, a plan is worked out with the student uh, to provide an alternative uh, to the, the lack of an elevator, in this case, in the Amos Eden building. So there's a lot of work that goes on every single year, and um, when we have handicapped students, there's a major effort to make sure that we can accommodate them or provide reasonable accommodations. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. And as I mentioned, two more questions. One from Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Mike McCabe, I'm the class of uh, 79. I'm uh, some kind of lifetime patroon. I've actually forgotten what kind. But um, I just had a couple of really simple, simple questions. Renew Rensselaer spoke about peer groups. Uh, people from the administration jumped up and cited all these numbers, but no one ever mentioned a peer group. Uh, question for the future, what are you comparing yourselves to? I think that would be most um, interesting. Then another question that I heard, because um, uh, Charlie Jackson's been president of the school now for, is it 18 years, eight, 17 to 19 years? 18, okay, a comment, a comment during the financial presentation was made that the finances were stabilized a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm just asking, is that an acknowledgement that the finances were in trouble a couple of years ago uh, after 10 or 15 years of her administration? and then it's been fixed since then. So this wasn't something that happened in the 90s. And those will be my two uh, questions, and thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I'll, I know there was one finance-related, yeah, finance but then you had a question about peer groups. Peer group. So I'll address the finance question first. Um, the, the comment about stabilizing the fi finances was really um, as a result of the Great Recession. And so, as most institutions experienced a lot of financial difficulty, um, as most people experienced, the, the, this institute did as well. And so, um, the, that is the comment in relation to that, and that we are now in a very much better place than we were then. So in terms of the peers, we, we do focus on uh, universities like us, uh, STEM-based institutions, private. STEM-based institutions. We saw a list prior uh, that, that highlighted them. The only one on that list that we go back and forth on relating to appear is Georgia Tech, because they're public institutions, but it makes it very difficult to make absolute comparisons. For example, their endowment doesn't have to be used much for buildings. It could be simply provided by the state. Uh, so therefore, you, you get the list of the institutions, MIT on the top, probably RIT, WPI, uh, Lehigh below us. Uh, and uh, and then we're in the middle. Thank you, John. Now I have a que uh, question from Wade. Good morning. I'm Wade Abbott. I'm class of '95. <clears throat> I have a uh, quick comment and then a question. And the comment is because I think it's important to reinforce common themes. And sometimes you have to hear the same message multiple times for it to sink in. Knowledge and thoroughness, right? I embraced that in my four years here. I've embraced it since then. My children, to this day, hear details matter. They can recite that anytime they're doing their homework. Now, clearly, Renew Rensselaer has done their homework. They shared it with us up here. It's well documented. 
and I'm disappointed that RPI did not complete their homework. They didn't turn it in. There was no accompanying documentation, and frankly, your time management was lacking, respectfully. You went five minutes over. <coughs> Renew Rensselaer, five minutes under. One of the topics talked about at length was MPAC, which I don't believe was mentioned in Renew Rensselaer's discussion at all. And frankly, I think that was an attempt to highlight a positive news article and kind of distract us. So to reiterate, we want to see your homework. We want it turned in. We want it in writing. Now, I feel strongly, and this is my question, I feel strongly that the issues facing RPI are issues of leadership. Changing the world requires leadership. Why are we reducing opportunities for students to be leaders within the student union? Why are we reducing opportunities for student accountability and student responsibilities rather than increasing them as students have proven over a century or more in their activities in the student union? Thank you. Wade, I appreciate that. As I said earlier, I believe in the union. But I know, too, that the union at Rensselaer is a part of the institution. It's an important part. And we're working every day to strengthen some of the relationship issues that have contributed to where we are. Some of the changes that people have discussed with me um, have been regulatory oriented. If you look at how the union functions today. What changes specifically? The athletic budget. That's one example. Why, why yeah. the changes recently? Why are we reducing, if my question is specific, why are we reducing the opportunity for student leadership right now? I want those leaders, those are our future. Those are the future administrators potentially of this institute, future RAA members. We aren't taking it away. We are, in fact, doing a lot of that mentorship. They didn't need any help before. I'm sorry, and I mean no disrespect, but they had no oversight from RPI administration for a long time. Why is that necessary now? And I believe that is the question that he is asking. And many of us are asking. But then other people are saying, and I mean no disrespect, ma'am, but yeah. they're all speaking to sure. Me. Sure. Please. Sure. Please let me. Okay. To okay. Let me go back to the fundamental issue that has a number of people concerned and some confused, and that is that the current constitution of the union is not in alignment with the bylaws of the institute. We have to get that fixed. That's where the roots. So you're suggesting it's never been in alignment? No, I suspect. I haven't been able to complete a complete historical analysis of that, but it appears to be somewhere around 50, the last time the Institute's bylaws were updated because of regulatory compliance, legal kinds of concerns, somehow the union was not involved in that constitution. Right. So update, not, update that relationship, update those documents, but it shouldn't be in the direction of pulling things away from the students who are running the union, running the, the administration of students vis-a-vis -vis the Grand Marshal, the Senate, the, G the, the President of the Union, the Executive Board. That's their opportunity to learn, not be, not be run by the administration. Allow them to fail. We've had decades and decades of success and failures. This is the place to do that. Don't take it away. Yeah. And why not Great. update some of the bylaws to match with the union? Why not make the bylaws so late? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. The Institute's bylaws supersede everything. Oh. Well, that's my question. Oh. No, no offense. So what the answer is, back explain how to deal with it. Okay. All right. I, okay. Uh, I'd like for, for one of us, me, at this point, to answer a question rather than always to the administration. May I answer? 
Okay, so there'll be I'll give you a short, short one. No, I ran for president of the union in 1967. My platform was to increase dramatically the taxes upon the student union. That action followed a long line of very wise financial decisions going back 100 years. In my uh, inaugural address, if you can call it that, an interview with the Poly, I explained that we needed to have the funding to include all the athletics so that we would not lose the ability to control our student union, the student union which, by the way, taxed itself earlier to build the building in the first place. So you can talk about bylaws all you want, but we've had a tremendous track record of 125 years of looking out for the future of the institution and for the welfare of the students. Work with the students, don't dictate to them. Bill, thank you everyone. We're, we do have to close uh, now, but from a REA board perspective, we have a couple of recommendations. We have the resolution that we're going to take under consideration. We also have the resolution from Jerry that we're going to take under consideration as well. And I do see that as a big next step in terms of how do we continue. Uh, there's, we're ending now, but this is not the end of the discussion. There's more that we can uh, move forward on. And again, I appreciate everyone being here. I know some of you came from long distances. Myself, I came from Seattle. I live there. I, I got, I, I arrived yesterday. And so my wife's pregnant. I have an 18-month-old son. So, so I know we, we all make sacrifices to be here, but it, it's all for, our, all for our institute. So we all love our alma mater, and we're here to, to continue that. And so that's why the RA board, members of the Rensselaer Alumni Association, we're going to work with the administration to continue uh, moving forward. So again, I thank the administration for being here today. <laughs> our petitioners who represent Renew Rensselaer, all our alumni who came in, really appreciate everyone coming out, having a, a very passionate discussion about these topics. Now I will. Uh, I'll take. I'll take a, a motion to adjourn. All right. Now I, I'll be sticking around, and as well as a few others, if anybody had RA specific items.